Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Fargo 3D Printing Podcast today. Um, we got a special guest in today. We have Ben Bernard from uh, NDSU. We have uh, myself, Jake Clark, uh, John Schneider, uh, Todd Atchison, who is one of the employees here. And then we have multimedia guy, Eric, um, is also behind the mic today. So, um, so Ben, um, why why are you important? Why are you here? <laughs> wow. wow. That was that was right from the show notes. Why, why, why is Ben important? Why is Ben important? That is exactly what it is. So tell me why you're important, Ben. Outstanding. So um, I work for the Department of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at North Dakota State University. And um, I've been looking for a long time on how my department could get into 3D printing because it's really important for architects and landscape architects to be able to to get hands-on with their design and they oftentimes spend lots of hours assembling models by hand it's a lot of work they're using it zapto blades at 3 a.m and bleeding it's kind of scary and so uh we wanted to be able to make that process easier with technology and and the other cool thing about 3d printing is Designers can make complex surfaces and structures you can't ordinarily do by hand. So, you know, you think of the Frank Gehry stuff, those really complex curved surfaces. How do you do that with basswood, right? And kind of tricky. <laughs> and exactly so, nice. yeah. and hours on it. <laughs> and so, I, I looked at, at 3D printing with uh, some of my colleagues in uh, the engineering departments in. Um, Ooh, five, seven years ago. And the cost of the equipment were 30000 and 50000 and $100,000. And the cost of the material was $3, $5 a cubic inch. So it was just way out of our, our price range. Um, but so um, three years ago, um, I was looking into the RepRap printers. And uh, so I could see that there was some potential here. You could kind of build your own thing. Um I had uh, one of my lab assistants, Dusty Austin, take a crack at it, and after I had him look at it for a week and evaluate it, he was like, you know, I, was, I had to tell him, I was like, man, we don't have the budget for this, and maybe next year, and he's like, I already ordered all the parts myself. I'm putting this together, <laughs> and and so it's I, happening. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of got a sense. It's like, shoot, I'm not the only person who thinks 3D printing is cool. This is this is there's something here that you know it captures people's imaginations. So he built it. It was cool, but it really wasn't quite ready for for prime time use. Um, so we took another year to to investigate it, and uh, so. We were keeping an eye on, on the MakerBot. We figured we'd purchase some of the Rep Ones, and then they had a clicking talk uh, a clock on their website. So it's like, oh wait, we're not going to order that. They <laughs> something might, big come is they, coming. They might have something new. <laughs> so we ordered a uh, you know they announced the Replicator Two in uh, I think December 2012. Um, we uh, immediately ordered some. Uh, they were delayed because of a little hurricane on the East Coast. So I told them they should really uh, start in Fargo. Um, <laughs> no, no hurricanes here. Just, just, just no five hundred and thousand year floods. Exactly. So it's a great place to to be in three D printing. Um, so um, once we got our hands on, then you know it was really uh, they had a, a great community of users, um, which I what I demanded to be plugged into, so I could keep these things working. Um, and so, uh, that's where I, uh, found that, uh, Mr. Jake Clark yes. was using the printers in a manufacturing capacity, which I was just thrilled by because I could tell my faculty and I could tell students, here's this machine being used in the real world to design and make things. And so, and Jake was extraordinarily helpful with, uh, helping us figure out how to keep the machines running and uh, helping us uh, go from the design on the 3D side to, to making things, printing things, which essentially was one of his, his job responsibilities. Uh, so, and then at the same time, um, uh, John was looking at doing a, a maker space uh, using 3D printing, using uh, laser cutting, and, and was talking to me about some of the technologies to make that work out uh, at uh, my department, North Dakota State University, 
we provide laser, I, I'm responsible for providing laser cutters available to students and computers to students. And so we kind of have our own internal maker space. And I was really happy and excited to share that with John. Um, and the word got out that we were hacking with this stuff. And so uh, that summer, uh, the Fargo Public Library invited uh, me to give a talk on 3D printing. And, you know, I, I always think of, okay, what, what does the public need to know about this technology? Well, they need to, you know, certainly hear the education side of the story, but then they also need to hear the manufacturing story. They also need to hear the makerspace story. And so I invited Jake and John to talk about this technology with me in a panel discussion, and then everyone could bring their bots. Everyone could, you know... Um, uh, J, uh, John brought the uh, uh, Taz and uh, what Taz was that? That was the the original <clears throat> Taz. That was actually one of the first fifty off their production line. Nice. Yeah. And then I was really excited to invite Jake to bring his bot in case mine didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> mine was doing production stuff, prototypes. That was a rep mm. too. Important. Yes. Important. Okay. Important. So 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 again, it, the the more bots you can have in front of the public, the better, and. Uh, we just had a blast. Mm -hmm. And who did we find there? Yeah. It was Todd, <laughs> our uh, the guy that is uh, doing some of our assembly work with the, with the parts order downstairs. And I ended up just going because I thought it was something my son might be interested in, and I ended up going down the rabbit hole on this stuff just <laughs> after that meeting. So. Still, just a little bit. <laughs> and keep in mind, this is in the summer of 2013 is when all this is taking place. And we had a packed house. Um, we had... Fifty or sixty showed up that day. Yeah, I want to say it was like even more than that. For a public yeah. library event? Yeah, for that's, a public library event. That's mm -hmm. a, cr a crazy it's amount. Huge. We had local media attend and cover the event. Um, local media also followed up with uh, me after the event to, to continue uh, doing features on, uh, on the technology and how um, the students at uh, Architecture and Landscape Architecture were using the technology for their designs. Um, in within the department, we expanded from um, two uh, replicator twos to six, and uh, started growing a production three D printing lab. Um, and uh, then uh, we uh, I collaborated with uh, the library at NDSU to uh, start a uh, uh, get some grant funding so all the students at North Dakota State would have access to three D printing. We uh, started with a lab of, of four replicator twos. Uh, we also partnered with student government on that, which was a, a huge help in, in helping us get the grant awarded. Um, then uh, at the same time, I was sharing this story at, at NDSU. Um, the Department of Psychology did some test prints with us and purchased a replicator a fifth gen. I have to ask, why was psychology using the 3D printer? That's a good question. <laughs> so one of the... Th reasons why I'm so excited about 3D printing is, again, it's a, such a powerful tool for designers, but it's a powerful tool for almost every discipline. And and I really got a sense of, of that I, because I would uh, demo the technology uh, within NDSU. There's a group of um, folks within the Division of uh, Information Technology. Uh, I was invited to present the technology in front of um, the faculty as a part of um, a learning um, uh, conference at the beginning of the school year. And um, so faculty from other departments started coming to me and saying, hey, could we try this. Could we do this? Um, with psychology, there's a researcher by the name of Dr. Ben Ballas, and his research is with uh, cognitive uh, visual or infant uh, learning. So the, basically, how do babies visualize a world and, and learn about the world around them? Because that's, that's how I have two uh, young boys at home. And it's, it's just <laughs> fascinating to watch kids learn you know, as babies learn about the world about them so so how how do we learn how they how how the infant brain wires itself and works well the way we do that is by presenting them objects they haven't seen before okay well how do you give them objects they've never seen before right well you design it and print it <laughs> and as it turns out there's these cool little troll guys called greebles and they have these weird little hooked noses and ears and they're they're, they're funky looking dudes and so so dr ballast was like hey can you 
print some of these? And of course my answer was, well, buy the filament and I'll print what you want. And so um, we uh, printed a whole army of these little greeble guys. And again, it was so successful uh, working with the infants that then they, they purchased their own printer. And um, one of the, again, powerful things about 3D printing is that the PLA is is really robust. It's it, you know, So babies aren't going to yeah. break it. They're not going to eat it. There's no sharp edges. Mm -hmm. And so again, it, who would have thought a psychology department needs a 3D printer? That, well, that's pretty yeah. incredible. <laughs> and and um, of course, the engineering departments, uh, the, um, the egg uh, engineering folks, the mechanical engineering folks, uh, a lot of inventors, um, there's an innovation competition at NDSU. So we're encouraging folks to invent products that, that meet a need. And so uh, one student wanted to uh, print um, uh, components for this competition for an aerial drone. There was a senior design uh, competition in a, a, a egg engineering to build a, a seed break system for, for agricultural seeders. And, and what was really cool is, again, is these weren't just prototypes, but the PLA was strong enough that they were actually functional components right off the bat. And so I was really excited to work with the library to get a lab for the whole department, for the whole campus, just so I didn't have to worry about all these external folks to my department tying up the printers my students wanted to use. <laughs> right. um, so that was a, a really strong incentive for me. But, but then also, um, it's just amazing to give creative people tools and see what they'll use them for. Mm -hmm. And so a fantastic story that the library has had with their 3D printing lab is some of the first users were the music department. Huh, and again, really? you'd be like, why would a music yeah. department need 3D printers? Well, as it turns out, um, it's really important for instrumentalists to practice with the mouthpieces. So you get that proper uh, embouchure. Oh, yeah. oh, that's a big word there, John. I was a band kid. I know what's up. <laughs> I, know what's up. I play piano. That's all I got. And so if to, to buy these mouthpieces is expensive. And of course... Students are always looking for ways to, to save. And so you can print mouthpieces inexpensively in a 3D printer. And another fantastic story is, is that um, the North Dakota State Marching Band sometimes finds itself performing in cold weather. I mean, kind of crazy, but it, but it happens. <laughs> yep. And if you're a brass instrumentalist... A uh, cold metal on the lips is sometimes uncomfortable. Oh, I, I played trombone. I, I know that feeling. A lot of pep band in about 32 degree weather is uh, your your lips start getting numb pretty quickly. And We're so have you play some Timmy trumpet in this building yeah. then? Yeah. And so what was cool <laughs> was is that there were uh, uh, a, a student was like, hey, this mouthpiece which I printed for practice, it's it's good enough. I can use it on my instrument. And so. Of course, then, you know, it's like, hey, my lips didn't freeze. And so then half the marching band is printing their own mouthpieces <laughs> um, for performance. And it's it's making the band work. So it's, it's amazing what happens when you give creative people the tools they need to make things. And you just never know what you're going to see. And the, the technology is easy enough to use that anyone can do it. And so my, my pitch for um, the different departments across campus is that this 3D printing is a fundamental tool for teaching, research, and design. So if I'm teaching physics or biology or mathematics, you know, whatever I'm teaching, I can print models, which I can toss around to the students in the class. You know, the PLA is durable. It's not going to break. If they do break, I print another one. Um, and then... Um, it's a really useful tool for research. And again, the cognitive infant lab at, at, you know, with psychology or any number of uh, research components. Uh, there was a uh, egg engineering student which was uh, trying to make a better process for cleaning sunflower seeds. So they printed a, a better sunflower screen device which they prototyped with a 3D printer. Um, so there are a lot of lot of interesting research that you can do, and of course, design. You know, it's it's a fundamental design tool for architecture and landscape architecture, and the technology is inexpensive enough for anyone to be applying it. So that was where I was really thrilled.
that uh, Jake and John saw the opportunity to uh, found Fargo 3D Printing because then uh, I now have um, experts, which I can go to, uh, to uh, consult with me on new printer models or to help me maintain or retrofit the machines that were already operating. Um, I don't have to be the one-stop shop. So for this library grant, because again, I have some other duties within the Department of Architecture, Landscape Architecture, which don't involve 3D printing. Mm -hmm. um, if a machine goes down at the library, I don't have to worry about fixing it or maintaining it. That can be someone else's problem. <laughs> That's so, my problem. <laughs> there, man. So, so yes, I've created problems for Jake and John. Thank you. Yeah. But we solve them very well. And and yeah, that's the important <clears throat> well, part. So what's going on um, right now? Is it like Hell Week or Production Week? What what do they call it <laughs> right now yeah. at at NDSU? Because I know it's like production. We'll and, just call it Production Week. And end of the semester. End of the final semester projects, project. That so I imagine that the the timeline for that is pretty oh. like the laser cutter. I know you said there was a line for that. <laughs> Like, like how, how are the students using it now? So um, <laughs> my my second year students um, and faculty, uh, you know, sometimes we call it production week. Uh, this year they called it super fun week. <laughs> um, with no sleep. <laughs> loaded up with irony there. Yeah. Um, so um, I came to the Department of Architecture and Landscape Architecture again with an IT background, not a design background. And I felt I had a really good handle on higher education uh, with my um, undergrad at Valley State uh -huh. because I kind of had my hands in every academic department. I'm a very interdisciplinary guy. And then I come to the Department of Architecture and, and Landscape Architecture and um, the first week it was like, um, we're 24-7. <laughs> And so you can help us make sure this equipment runs at 3 a.m., right? <laughs> and I was like, why would students be working at 3 a.m.? Well, because they're design students. Um, so um, That's when they work. It, it's, and it's, anyone on a computer, they're going to be up all hours. Yeah. It's, it's certainly not uncommon that uh, our students, um, because it, it, we're a very aggressive program on the architecture side, we have a five-year master's degree. And so we cram a lot of stuff in, which, which means students have to work pretty hard. And, and it's also a profession which you, you have to be talented and you have to work hard. So um, talk, talk about uh, uh, maybe maybe Brian Brian Clare a little bit. <laughs> I will. Okay. Please, please so, at some point talk about him I, I, and his, his application. I, I certainly will. So so anyway, um, so for the end of semester, um, we have... We haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's that too. I was going somewhere at this. Sorry. Um, so for the end of semester, um, well, the design curriculum has... Um, what we call design studio. So um, each year of students accepted in our professional program, we have a second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year design studio each semester. Uh, it's the core of the curriculum. It's a six credit hour class that meets every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning or afternoon. And they work on design problems with the faculty. So you've got uh, uh, 18 students to each one faculty member. So it's you're, you're very hands-on. You know, other programs, you might be in a lecture hall with 200 or 400 other people learning math 101 that that's not how you, you train designers so so oftentimes these students for their design studios they have to make a model or they have to um, present their design on presentation boards and then you know there's a um, a presentation they have to give uh, so for example our fourth year fall architecture students work in two person teams uh, to make a high rise. Uh, they, in the, the beginning of the fall semester, they fly out to San Francisco wow. to see the site because, you know, we, we certainly have some Fargo high rises, but, you know, San Francisco has some. some you mean the overpass, right? <laughs> has some, has some larger tall. ones. <clears throat> and so, so we, we get our, our students on the site so they can see what a high-rise is and they can see how to design it. So they come back and they spend the whole semester designing a high-rise. And so if any of you in the area want to take a peek uh, at Renaissance Hall, 650 MP Avenue, on fifth floor, you can see these immaculate, ginormous models 
um, many of which are, are lit up with LEDs and they're pretty. Um, oh. And um, s- many of them have um, components which have been 3D printed. And all of them have components which uh, used our 60-watt uh, laser cutters. So uh, students will use lots of time on our uh, department makerspace technology so they can assemble these models. And, and we also have a traditional wood shop. So some things work best in a wood shop, some things work best in a laser cutter, some work, things work best on a 3D printer, some things still work pretty well by hand. And so students take all the skills they've learned up to this point to, to put together the product. And that's just one studio. <laughs> so there's still all the other studios on the architecture and landscape architecture side, which are all doing projects at the same time. And so, yeah, we put on um, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of hours on our equipment both 3d printers and and laser cutters um and we need to keep them running i have a dedicated team of student lab assistants which help me um, train in their fellow students on the equipment and operating it we do something very unique at uh, north Dakota state where the students in the department of architecture and landscape architecture can use the laser cutter and 3d printers without paying any additional fees so uh, we have uh, a okay. differential tuition, which is one third of standard tu- tuition, but that fee covers my position. It covers the technology and department. It covers the wood shop. It covers some of that travel to San Francisco and other uh, studio trips. Um, but so if we're asking students to do that, why would we nickel and dime them for time on 3D printers or laser cutters? Mm-hmm. Well, that would be kind of bad. Well, it turns out a lot of departments are bad. So, so <laughs> <laughs> um, across the country, it's pretty common that design students would expect to pay uh, 50 cents or a minute of time to use a laser cutter. Um, I just learned that uh, one uh, university in uh, the southeast, students are required to buy their own lens assembly for the laser. So it's a $300 part that they have to buy. And then they can use the laser one hour a day. What? Um, So I do something a little different where I train in uh, volunteer students and some of my lab assistants uh, to operate the laser cutters we're collaborating with the students. It's not, here's my file, now run it for me. It's, it's a collaboration to make sure we take care of the equipment, but then it's accessible. And so then we pretty much allow students to use that equipment 24-7. Um, and the same thing with the 3D printers. So I'll, I'll train in students, and then once they've satisfied my training requirements, they can use as much filament as they like, as long as it's for academic use. If, if it's non-academic use, I ask that they purchase their own filament. Um, but then uh, they can use the 3D printers as much as they need to get the job done. And so that's one nice thing about having lots of 3D printers. So uh, my design students tend to make big stuff. And big stuff on one machine, well, that's a lot of separate print jobs. Well, if you have six machines and you break up that print job between six machines, you're going six times faster. So um, it's really handy to be able to build a bot farm, or at least bare minimum, um, if you're engaged in any type of enterprise, um, not just a, a home level thing, but you're, you're, you're running a business and you need to prototype things, have at least two machines. I like redundancy, but yeah. and then I also like throughput. So well, if then can, if one breaks down, you got another one to rely right. on while you're fixing the other one. Amen. It's like most people have two cars. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, 3D printing is, is a fundamentally um, powerful technology, and uh, it gets heavy use uh, in our department, especially around production times, and then uh, we, we try to keep things uh, running with the uh, assistance of some dedicated lab assistants and with the assistance of uh, Fargo 3D printing. So, <laughs> with that said, um, so I mean, and, and the, the, the one thing that... Uh, Ben's, you know, not only is his architectural department important to us, it's because, you know, he is the one that introduced John and I and really got Fargo th- Fargo 3D printing rolling. Actually, um, the first phone call I, I ever um, really had with John was I was actually walking out of a out of a Hooters <laughs> um, to go home, and I was actually going down to the cities. Minneapolis is Minneapolis, St. Paul. So you look at some high-end 3D printers, so your SLA, SLS, MJP machines, 
Um, and I was like, oh, well, maybe Ben wants to come with. Well, Ben couldn't, but he said, hey, check, you know, call John. John might might be interested. I was like, I have no idea who John is, but let's call John and see what happens. So I'm sitting there in Hooters. I grab one of their uh, one of their little like foldable stand things. I quit. I steal a pen from the waitress. I'm writing down his information. And as I'm walking out of Hooters, I give John a call, and you know, almost what now, a year and a half later, we're something like that. Yeah. We're we're at where we're at. I mean. It's it's been a it's been a fun ride. I mean, yeah, we we the four of us really really got to know each other. You know, Todd, John, Ben, and I at the at the demos, and we got a lot of people interested. I mean, I, there was one guy. <laughs> I don't I don't know. I was with one of your lab assistants, and uh, her and I were standing there talking to this guy, and he's like, "Uh, but wh- how can you how can you do that? Yeah, how how can you do that?" And I'm like, "With you know this or that." And he's like, "Oh, this thing it, it's all assembled." How, how did how how did it like how his mind was just gone. he couldn't completely, talk completely blown <laughs> At all. which is one of the best things about 3D printing and is just, introducing it to people and watching their brains blow up it is and then you're just they're just like how how um but uh do the do the do the uh, talk about Brian Brian sure. a little bit just, like just just a little so, bit so I, I have had lots of incentives to work with uh, this technology. And uh, one of my incentives was, uh, so I, I scout the student talent. And so uh, in second year studio, I uh, was you know kind of keeping an eye, seeing what's on students' desks, what they're making. It's one of the privileges of working with the designers is, is taking a look and seeing what they're doing. And one student was making um, artifacts from uh, the Valve game Portal. He was he was modeling. He, he was he was using a laser cutter to to cut acrylic, and then he was lighting it with LEDs to do like crazy like portal uh, bookshelf ends. And he was casting replicas. If uh, folks are familiar with the, the video game Mass Effect, he was he was casting his own replica plasma rifles and so it's like okay this guy enjoys making things he needs to work with me (laughs) (laughs) and he needs to help me maintain the laser cutters Uh, because again you you always look for folks which which have an itch they're trying to scratch and so, and he clearly had 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 that going for him. The boy so is itchy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is to solve that. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> and so, so you know, so um, as soon as um, I uh, got my first set of replicator twos, it became really clear I was going to need some heavy um, uh, student. Uh, mentorship because I needed to figure out the pipeline from going from our 3D software to making 3D objects. So we needed to figure out how to go from SketchUp to 3D printing, how to go from 3ds Max to 3D printing, how to go from Revit to 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And um, I rely heavily on my students for those design skills. Um, So Um, We picked up the uh, Replicator 2s, and then I promptly hired Brian. And um, uh, again, he quickly became adept at um, solving those design problems and then also digging into the hardware. So uh, Struder would not be working right, and he'd be right there helping with me, tearing the thing apart, putting it back together. Um, again, and it was really fun to be collaborating with, with Jake and John during that time because we'd kind of figure something out, we'd share that. They would figure something out, they'd share that with us. Um, so again, it was a great example of how um, research universities need to collaborate with folks to solve problems. And, and that's what universities need to do. It's, it's, it's what we do. Um, so um, uh, Brian quickly became adept at uh, printing um, for for design work. And so one of the first models that we made, he spent about 40, 50 hours on the Replicator 2 uh, printing together components for a space hotel. Because naturally, if 
you're an architect. You want to design space hotels. So he um, printed all of his components and he printed them so they fit together. So the the final model is about the size of uh, uh, the table we're sitting around, which is... Um, what, like it's six, a podcast there. Like three, <laughs> right. Three, three by six or something. Three by six table. So, so yeah. So... A pretty decent size model. And so um, he's walking down the stairs because uh, Renaissance Hall is a five floor building. Uh, our 3D printing lab is on fourth floor. He was printing, on, uh, presenting on second floor. And of course, you know, again, you, you, you do, you finish all your work at the last minute. So <laughs> he was, took his model from, from walking down the stairs, dropped his model. Oh man. <laughs> if he had made his model traditionally, he would have had a pile of splinters, right? But, and so, so again, and the cool thing is, is that, again, 3D printers, you know, you don't set them typically to print solid. You no. set them so that they're 85% hollow. So it bounces down the stairs <laughs> and two flights of stairs. Oh, Jeez. And everything is still intact. Wow. Wow. Nothing's it made, it made broken. The, it made the corner. It made the corner. <laughs> 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 everything just worked and so um again that that really speaks to how powerful the uh, technology is that uh you can use it and abuse it in ways that you can uh do with t traditional models and so um we did hear a story that someone, <laughs> you know what i'm talking about is that, i think this is the prairie public one uh maybe I'm, i i only heard part of it it was uh you usually step on a gem to show the, the durability of something like yes. a, a gem shaped yes. model and then I guess some jokester at NDSU printed a, a like a hollow one, zero infill. So it was just the two shells. I heard that you jumped on it and it just shattered. No, that's okay. not true. That's not true. Or I for, or I deliberately forgot the memory. No, okay. no, no. <laughs> um, um, so the the story there is Brian has a special gift for making <laughs> video game replicas. And of course, naturally, um, some of the translucent PLA is just gorgeous. And uh, we picked up uh, some translucent red and translucent green. Uh, fabulous. My, as I'm talking on this podcast, I'm playing with a ruby red translucent. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> not in bolt because it's you know one of my favorite things in the world. But anyway, so... Um, so uh, he um, and and I, I I as one of the perks of my lab assistants have is they get to test print bots to make sure they're working correctly. If something's not working correctly, well, we need to do a test print to make sure it's working correctly. And there's some nice filament to use to test print. So so Brian designed a rupee from a Legend of Zelda. Be, and, and again, it's it's gorgeous. And, and it's really funny because most everyone recognizes it right away. Mm -hmm. Like if we're short, you know, prospective students are walking through, it's like, whoa, it's a rupee. Or high school kids, it's a rupee. And of course, you know, um, older professionals, which are coming in through, uh, might not recognize it. But again, it's cool. You can you can totally tell uh, who's awesome if what, they recognize <laughs> it or not. Well, so, so again... At the stand, the with the translucent filaments, you can see the infill inside. You can see the honeycomb pattern, and that's mostly hollow. And yeah, I, I really enjoy the demo of jumping in. And I'm not a, a light person. I'm six three and two hundred fifty pounds. <laughs> so when I jump on something and it still survives, that, that, that means something. But um, these these rupees are again are. are beautiful with an infill but then of course brian was like well they'll be even more beautiful if we print them without an infill and it was also a good test to see when we're making complex objects how far that filament can span um and it's actually amazing to watch it's one of my favorite things with a 3d printer watching that filament span a distance and just barely sag mm -hmm. um and so we have you know, we typically have some, uh, the, you know, the the rupees with infill and rupees without infill. Um, but uh, no, I always because you can it's translucent, so you can tell. Yeah, yeah. So I have not been successfully okay, punked I've, I've to made, my knowledge. Maybe, However, maybe, maybe he, maybe he I will tell you the actual story. Okay, okay. <laughs> which is there, there is a story when I I have done um, my demos with the uh, local media. I, I do share the story about Brian's space hotel model, and I will drop it. 
And so, um, so clearly this is a design flaw at Brian's, but so <laughs> the uh, component of his model, which, you know, snaps into the other parts of the model, that has been known to break on dropping. Um, so um, that's where I've, I've had fun demoing things with people, um, tell, but, but not the rupees. Okay. Tell, tell, well, you should tell the story about the softball. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Softball is a good story. So, that is a good so I got really excited. Um, this is on PLA. Um, because I got some uh, filament donated to uh, the department from a vendor. And this was over the summer. And so I, uh, I told my lab assistants, you know, go crazy with the printing because we've got lots of, of donated filament coming. And Brian is a softball player. So he's always been really curious about how strong is PLA really, right? So he printed a softball out of PLA at 10% infill and 20% infill and 50% infill and then he 80% infill and one which is just solid. <laughs> and this is translucent green too, by the way. So, so NDSU testing of PLA. Um, and so, um, and then they recorded their results. So, of course, you know, at 20% infill, uh, you can smash um, the PLA softball. And at you know, 50% infill, you can smash the PLA softball. And at uh, 100%, so a solid PLA softball, uh, they broke the aluminum bat. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we proudly display the survivor um, uh, on our demo table at uh, NDSU Architecture, Landscape Architecture, you can you can see a little mark from the aluminum where the impact occurred, um, and it's also a really fun uh, display item because you know again it's got some heft to it because it's, like, it's, it's a, like a grapefruit. It's dense. It's a yeah. solid piece of PLA, but it also floats. So PLA is buoyant. So so we've filled a sink and uh, tested, and, <coughs> and everyone loves the the, the you know, because it's a it's the translucent green globe of PLA. So um, it, it has a place of honor with us. And uh, well, we were on Prairie Public, and so we were doing something live, and John and I did our part, and we come back, and so we're listening to the live feed, and and he's Ben's talking, Ben and Brian are talking about the softball thing, and. And the lady's like, oh, well, you know, how, you know, something, something, how, uh, how durable is it? He's like, well, and then you heard silence. And all of a sudden you just heard this loud thud. <laughs> <laughs> you just hear the thing hit the floor and then just burst out loud. And you're just like, oh, well, that's pretty, pretty durable. <laughs> and you're, and they're wood floors in Renaissance Hall. Oh, man. And you're just wondering what the people downstairs are thinking. <laughs> oh, there goes Ben again, dropping this <clears throat> Ben 3D printed softball. <laughs> it's like a shot put is what that yeah. is. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, it's, um, again, just fun to work with design students with some serious talent and seeing how they apply the technology and what they're making with it. And, uh, you know, even outside of the design departments, just seeing how people will, will use equipment and hack with it is, is amazing stuff. And it's, it's always interesting to see how the technology is utilized across the board. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I don't know. It's, it's cool. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's cool, cool stuff. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're speechless. But I mean, to, to actually, you know, <clears throat> see a practical use for it, because there's a lot of people that they just print gnomes. Yeah, you know, just just trink <laughs> yeah. I, I just trinkets and stuff, and there's a lot of that stuff out there. And yeah, there's a lot of, of cool stuff, and I've printed my fair share of Yoda heads, you get Lego uh, pieces. Yep. But when you see when you see it being used to communicate something to someone else, or yeah. to it, for the psychology example, I thought was great. I never would have thought of something yeah, like that. Yeah, like what what I thought they were just you know reading books and trying to read people's <laughs> minds. Well, yeah. that's what I show I, I show up and he's got like these things that look like like weird looking birds oh. on snowman. I'm like, what is this? He's like, oh, it's something for the psychology department. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, you simultaneously okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. But wait, okay, what is it? Again? Yeah, how did you come up with that? Yeah, and and what's again a fantastic thing about um, using 3D printing is it it's it's an opportunity to collaborate with large amounts of folks. So, a um, uh, month ago, I got a call from the NDSU cabinet shop, and they said, "Ben, we need to print a saw blade handle." Huh. 
or saw blade guard, whatever, right? And it's like, you know, if we if we email you the, the STL, can you print it for us? And again, it's like, I want to see if this works. Like, sure, let's. And so, yeah, so we I, I printed the afternoon. It was like a half hour job. And then um, they put it in pretty, they, they came in and they're like, yeah, this is exactly what we wanted. They showed me the piece that was broken and they showed me the, the part they had me print. And then they put it in production the next morning. Um, my uh, classroom technologies group at NDSU has given me some uh, brackets and uh, some um, zip tie clips that they want to test with. Um, I uh, One of MakerBot's success stories, which they profiled, was a, uh, a medical technician uh, within a hospital, which saved uh, his uh, institution like something crazy, like $80,000 in six months, just by printing... Uh, replacement surgical table knobs and zip tie huh, clips. Wow! Because apparently um, those aren't cheap, and if a surgical table is out of operation in a hospital, that costs money. So um, they're just amazing machines with a lot of utility, and it's always interesting to hear the stories of how people are using them and what they're using for. Whether they're uh, designers, whether they're inventors, whether they're musicians, whether they're hobbyists. It's just remarkable. My son's uh, robotics team is a good example. They yeah. they get a lot of traditional materials in the kit that they use to build their robot: aluminum, wood, um, you know, different things that they have to work with. And they're also given an educational copy of SolidWorks. A lot of the teams have no clue what to do with that educational copy of SolidWorks, but um, over the years, our team has kind of learned how to use that to develop parts. They've always gone and machined out aluminum or cut out aluminum pieces and done things like that. This year, they actually designed a claw in SolidWorks and printed it prior to doing any of the metal work or any of the machining just to make sure that all the pieces worked, everything fit together, and they used it to present to the rest of the team, this is our idea, this is what we want to build for this part, for this robot, and the results were just amazing. Uh, you know, that using that it just shortened the whole process of being able to think in plastic first rather than having to go through all of the work of the machining and all that so just simple applications like that well, really, how, how long did it take to machine that it took him it took him a couple days a couple nights on the on the mill to machine i mean and if you're looking at doing a change that just saved him right weeks right he project. worked out all you know all the collisions all the the problems that probably could have there could have been he worked that all out ahead of time in 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 plastic and uh and then once he actually went to mill the machine all the parts fit and everything did, did he test the the 3d printed piece on he did. the robot he did okay. well they didn't test it on the robot okay. but they tested it for motion and range of motion okay and all so, that so, it, so it could have been functional but they didn't yep. end up they were just going to make it in metal anyway right. Yeah. Okay. They they can only use the the materials that they're given. In oh, the I was kit. thinking just for like a practice kind yeah. of like let's see if it works. Yeah, that's kind of they they built a um, just a static model and then they okay. built a working model of right. mechanical parts. So one of my favorite design stories is uh, two years ago I had a thesis student by the name of Jeremiah Johnson, and his thesis project was to uh, designing a subterranean steam house in Minnesota. I've seen this model. And so wow. how do you design a subterranean steam house in a, in a way that you can understand the design? And so he uh, took his model in SketchUp and sliced it into like 25 different pieces. And then we printed each piece separately um, on the, the, the MakerBots, you know, each piece taking an hour, two hours to print. And then he mounted that to um, a wood board with hinges so you could see the model together as one piece and then to understand it from being in the subterranean uh, piece with the different chambers, you'd unfold, you, you know, the wood was on hinges, so you'd unfold each piece and I you like could, accordion. yeah, you, you'd get those interior views and shots. And it was just that could not have been represented in any other way. And it was a beautiful representation of, of the technology. Um, the other thing which I really enjoy about the technology as uh, someone who implements technology is there's, there's two different types of people in the world when you give them something new. There's those folks which are like, cool, right? I got to try this. And those people which are like, 
this is scary and I don't want to touch this, right? And so when I have worked with different folks within NDSU and then, you know, different folks outside NDSU um, in terms of, okay, how do I adapt this technology? Um, I get a chance to work with those folks which which are, like, cool, right? They're, they're the folks which um, aren't afraid. And, and a cool thing about 3D printing is anyone can can pick it up so when i collaborated with the li librarians um at ndsu so um there was um a social sciences librarian and an engineering librarian which which you know were, were interested in technology and they're like oh the library should have this and i was like well the ndsu impact grant is due two days from now let's write <laughs> let's write a grant application and they're like yeah grants two days like that's enough time it's like it's totally enough time. It's two days. And so we, we wrote it up. And um, again, uh, we shared with student government about it. And again, they were just mind blown. Like, we could do this. Like, yeah, we can do this. And, and so, you know, it, the presentation went fantastically well. And then we, we got the funding. And then, of course, right now it's like, crap, we got the funding. Like, <laughs> like now, we have, now we have to put this together. Now what? Right? And so, um, again, you know, there were some folks which were kind of like, well, we're, we're a library. Why? why? So actually, funny, funny, funny story. I was at um, a Paradox Cards and Comics yep. um, on a Saturday evening. Uh, because uh, nerd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jake, we're one to talk. <laughs> I just some, want to call one out when I see one. Some 3D printed X-Wing and TIE Fighters hanging from the wall. Hey, hey. So anyway, Just because I have a background of Star Wars uh, Scout Trooper does not mean I'm a nerd. Anyway, Saturday night, you, uh, Saturday, you're <laughs> yep, at a... Yep. So, 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 so uh, I heard at the table next to me, this guy's like, you know what, the, the library's doing the stupidest thing. You're getting 3D printers. Why is the library getting 3D like, printers? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, uh. So, so I was like, hey, do you, do you like... Board games, and of course, it's like, yeah, yeah, board games are awesome. And it's like, do you, do you like making models? It's like, yeah, yeah, of course. It's like you can use a three D printer for that. Really? <laughs> it's like, yeah. He's like, three D printers are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and and so so yeah, it, it, it's really fun to 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 watch the lights turn on, and then of course it's really awesome to to show the library staff that this can be used to draw people into a library because you know there's a lot of people which are like you know i don't read or if i read i'm, I'm reading online right like I, vhs tapes a, anymore i have a D, &D book right. I, 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 I don't need the library the expansion well, packs <laughs> the li creature manuals. libraries are really important places and they're they're one of the few places on a large campus where people from all disciplines come together and and so it's kind of a natural co collaboration space. So the idea was is hey, and this is a way to get people across the campus working together in, in ways they otherwise wouldn't. And it's also a way to get people which ordinarily wouldn't come to a library to use it. And so then it's like some of the lights turn on, like hey, we should have this in the library. And and so and so yeah, there's there's. Um, it's really cool to also, uh, the grant also funded some student staff uh, to, to help run the machines. So I was chatting with a, a freshman studying natural resources management. And again, he's like, this is the coolest campus job, right? There, there's um, students in a lot of disciplines you wouldn't think of, like, like music, like English, which, which are making everyday use of, of 3D printing. And then, then you've got library staff, right? You know, which, you know, reference desk folks, which again, you'd normally think of, you know, doing traditional library things. And they're just really <laughs> getting excited. Getting thing, getting books off the top of the Yeah, their Rolodex, <laughs> yeah. the Dewey Decimal System. They're just really excited to be using this technology. And, and, and again, drawing in a whole different crowd of folks into a library to, to be utilizing the space. So um, it's, it's just really cool to empower people and, and, and then watch people go from being the, this is scary, I can't do this, like I, I can't make things happen, to anything is possible and I can do this. Yeah, yeah I, kinda, kinda last thing I wanna cover is, is back to Todd's robotics um, thing mm -hmm. that his son was in. I mean, think about 
you know, they, they give you a box or a bucket of, of stuff to use from. Think of right. if they gave you a roll of printer filament. Right. And, or, you know, this, because every school has a printer. Right. And think about how that could change, you know, that, that whole face. You know, maybe you can only do 20% of your robot 3D printed, or you can only have 10 parts out of your, out of your robot 3D printed. Right. But that opens but that the whole... opens up the brain of every kid on the team... <clears throat> And now you're all kinds of new shapes and applications. And, and now you're not limited just to the shapes that you can make out of wood and nails and screws. Now you're okay. Well, this is a complex geom ge geometric shape right. that I can't create by hand, but I can create on a SolidWorks yep. and I can print it, and it's going to be BA. Right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that's that's what I think is cool is is when that pulls into that realm, you're going to see you know, the whole robotics thing just pick up because let's look, let's look at the lull spot with dual extrusion. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, if you're printing PLA or ABS rims and Ninja flex <laughs> um, <laughs> tires, awesome. or if you're doing right. PLA or ABS grip uh, arms with Ninja flex grips, yep. or maybe part of the competition is you have to put something in, in, in water. All of a sudden you put it in there and something dissolves or falls right. off. I mean, and, and you can take their brains before <clears throat> they've set and you can take this new technology, which you can do almost anything that your mind can think of with, and put it with their brains that they don't have really don't have a box yeah. that they've been put in yet, and put those two things together, mm -hmm. and who knows what you're gonna what's gonna come out of that. Well, I mean, they're giving them a box of parts, saying, "Here, you need to think within this box of parts." Right. You give them a 3D printer, a roll of 3D printer filament, and they're just like, "I can do anything with yeah. this. What can I make?" And all of a sudden, you just open the realm to so much more creativity and i mean that's i think you know i judged the robotics a couple weeks ago and it was awesome by the way it was it was it was as good as going to a bison game and being in the front row of the student section because it was that a lot of tension in the air especially when the top few teams are competing and the really scores tight are scores. tight and well and it's just upbeat the kids are act. I mean, they had mascots dancing on the. Yep. I mean, it was just. I, I got Pepper out there bands. and danced. Yeah. yeah, I got out there and danced with uh, some Dancing of the judges. Judge. Yep. Nice. Um, but I mean, that's that's the thing is you're gonna see with the three D printing filament and the printer in that space. Just once once it gets into that space, it's gonna explode, and right. so many students are gonna be like, "This is what I want to do." I actually, so really really quick story before we finish up here, um, is I was walking. In, I was judging. I was walking in what's called the pits where they have all the all the different bots sitting waiting for a competition. Not, not the sad kind. No, no, no. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm going to make sure I point that out for you. Um, so I'm walking. I'm just minding my own business walking and the student grabs me and I'm wearing my Fargo 3D printing shirt. He's like, 3D printing. That's that's cool stuff. He's like, I want to do this. How can I get a job doing that? And I sit there and go, Wow. This is something that the student wants to do as a career and has a passion to do as a career. And to sit there and talk with him for 20 minutes, you know, me as a, as a business owner and him as a student saying, hey, this is where you could go with this. I mean, you, you know, I look at do all what you're doing. Yeah. Do I do that? Look at all these different things you can get into. He's going to the school of mines um, for mechanical engineering, but I'm like, well, you could do this. You could do this. I said, this is where it could fit into uh, automation. This is where it could fit into mechanical engineering. This is where it could fit into uh, electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this, and the, like the student, the kid was just like, wow, that's cool. You know, and that's that's interesting. I want to do that, and I just it took me a bat. You know, it it you were taking that was a back here. Um, not great, but you know, I was taken aback right. um, <laughs> you know, by that because I was like, wow, somebody wants somebody is really passionate about the same stuff that we're passionate yeah. here at a young age, and think of where he's going to run with that technology. It, it harkens back to the early days when the personal computers first came out, and everybody was kind of like, what are you going to use that for? You know, mm -hmm. and there was so much potential nobody really knew where the application was and as people went along I don't think you know if you talk to people in 1980 what they were going to do with their personal computers desktop publishing was probably the last thing in their mind 
But if you look at any of the industries that was radically mm -hmm. changed by the personal computing movement, it was it was desktop publishing and printing. No. And I think we're still in that formative stage of 3D printing where everybody's kind of like, you know, this is really cool. How what how do I apply? Where does this fit? Mm -hmm. And what technology, what industry is this just going to radically shake up in the next few years? Well, I love doing because a lot of people are like, okay, 3D printing, what is it? And then it's like, okay, what can you do with it? Mm -hmm. And I just love saying, hey, go to thingiverse.com yeah. <laughs> and just look. Find something mm -hmm. and then you can see what so many other people have done out there. I mean, everything from how to print better to... You know, uh, leg lamp that we have hanging on our yep. Christmas tree. The, the comments are really helpful too because people, these people are trying stuff even if they don't think it's going to work. They want to see how it's going to turn out. Like, mm -hmm. can I work with that? Maybe a little exploit that you. I've seen people make like jellyfish things because they know if you shoot straight out, it's going to make like a little loop. It's not a functional thing, but it looks cool. People yeah. try weird stuff, and sometimes you get something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 really going to change going forward, and. And thank you, Ben, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, come over here and be our guest star on today's <laughs> podcast. Um, we'll have other guest stars in the future. Like I said, you're from where again? Uh, I'm from uh, well, Fargo. Um, I'm from uh, <laughs> good answer. Yes, uh, North Dakota State University's Architecture and Landscape Architecture Department as their uh, computer services specialist. Sweet. Well, thank you again for coming on. Uh, is there any other comments you guys want to want to say? No, I mean we're at, we're at right about at an hour, so it's yeah. been stayed with. Thank and you. it feels yeah. like five minutes. That's the great thing about three D printing. Yeah. Well, and there's more stories. That's the thing is there's so many more stories out there. But uh, take it away, John. Yeah. So on behalf of Jake, Eric, Todd, myself, and especially a big thank you to uh, to Ben for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Fargo three D printing podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe to us on iTunes, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and definitely check out our Pinterest and Instagram pages. So, again, on behalf of all of us, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Cavity search. <laughs> <laughs> I was just to the dentist. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why. <laughs> Well, they really got to the root of the problem. <laughs> <laughs>